I have to confess that <coughs> I left last week when God moved in such a powerful way. You know, like, where do we go from here? And <coughs> so I, I, just, I just made myself available this week. And, you know, there's a lot of words in this Bible. And I believe that God, through people, speaks to churches and I feel like I have a word from the Lord today. Um, and it kind of uh, progresses from last week. I don't know if you remember, and if you're not here, uh, it's, it's not going to be like you won't get it. Here's the word, basically. It was like, uh, and, and Donna McCaskill gave it. And um, it, it was, you're, we're, you, there, there's some of us that are just parked. And, um, and your parking ticket has been validated. And, and, you know, as I thought about that this week and talked to her a little bit after the service, a, a validated parking ticket is one that is stamped, paid, or something like that, and that would indicate that it's what? Time to park no more. It's time to move forward. And that was the impetus of my message last week was we're going to move forward, and it was out of Ephesians chapter 5. And so as I walked through the week, I just... I just continued to, to um, just hear, you know, it's the, the, it's, you know, and there's a lot of reasons we park, right? I mean, uh, we, we park in a spiritual location for, for many reasons, and uh, we'll not look at those reasons today, but some people have been just so blessed that they just park there, and some people have been just through such difficult circumstances that they park there, but there's nothing in the New Testament in the Old Testament, there's nothing in the Bible that would allow us to park inappropriately. Now, there's time for rest, and there's time to withdraw, and there's but but the Bible is a is a book of progress. It's it's a it's a book of moving forward. It's a book of of, of following the King who was in a grave, but the the ground started to shake. And he rose from the dead, and he's alive, and he lives in us. Therefore, we live, and we live to move forward. We live to affect our circumstances. We live to make progress. And um, so I, I have a, a, a word today, I, I would guess to say, um, about progress, about moving forward, and about a group of people who were somewhat parked and they were not willing to move forward into everything that God had for them. And, and, and I, I just pray that it would be a, a word that will edify you, bring encouragement to you, strength to you. I, I would suggest, and I do believe in faith, that, that uh, through my process this week, this is what the Lord uh, wants me to say to you today. So, we're going to do a little um, flipping around and just a little bit of a history lesson in the Old Testament. So Exodus, would you turn in your Bibles or your phones to Exodus chapter 1? Um, and, you know, if you don't mind me saying, I mean, God is just impressing me and doing some different things in your pastor. And um, I think it's, it's, it's pressing forward. I, I know it's pressing forward. And so I, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get free from having to put things on the screen for just a little while, okay, if you don't mind. So um, if you'd open your Bibles or your uh, phones, we're going to start in Exodus chapter 1, verse 11. Now, I'm, I'm not trying to make us uh, an Old Testament buff or anything like that, but I, I, we, we, we have to realize in the Old Testament that in Genesis chapter 12, God created the world but then there was a point in time and i know that this will be familiar to you that god picked out a, a, a man named abraham and therefore he picked out a nation and he said to this nation the israelites the jews he said you are mine you are my precious possession and all throughout the old testament the story is of a special people a people chosen by God. And in the history of that people, they found themselves in Egypt. And Egypt at first was a safe place. 
But after a while, Egypt became a not safe place, not a good place. And they were part in Egypt, so to speak. So Exodus chapter 1 is the first verse we're going to look at. Exodus chapter 1, verse 11. And this is just a description of where God's people found themselves in Egypt. They were there 400 years, by the way. But if you're in Exodus chapter 1, verse 11, it says, So they put slave masters over them to oppress them with forced labor. And they built Pithom and Ramses as store cities for Pharaoh. But the more they were oppressed, now we're speaking about the Jews, God's people. The more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread. So the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites. The Israelites were living in Egypt, but man, and so they started oppressing them and they started forcing them into labor. But the more they oppressed them, the more they grew, the more they multitude. I mean, these Jewish ladies would have large families and and, uh, and they would grow. In verse 13, they worked them ruthlessly. Verse 14, they made their lives bitter with harsh labor in brick and mortar and with all kinds of work in the fields. In all their harsh labor, the Egyptians worked them ruthlessly. I mean, the writer of Exodus, to me, just goes beyond, like over the edge, to use all these words that speak to how bad it was. That's my point, okay? It was just terrible. It was bad in Egypt. It started okay, but it ended up here bad. And the Egyptians were planning to do it worse. They, the next passages tell about how they, they told the midwives, you know, any boy babies, kill them. Don't bring them to birth. So it was just going from bad to worse. And God's people were crying out to God. And God heard their cry. And God raised up Moses. And Moses, I mean, we can go back to our Bible stories, but this is the true story of of God. Uh, The next little snippet I'd like to show you is Exodus 14. So just go from Exodus 1 to Exodus 14. And um, in verse 29, the Israelites cried out to God. God heard their cry. Could I encourage you, cry out to God, God hears your cry. And and he delivered them. He delivered them from Egypt through this incredible miracle, the parting of the Red Sea. So here it was, it was hard in Egypt, here's God delivering them. In verse chapter 14, chapter 14, verse 29. Give you just a minute to get there. But the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground with a wall of water on their right and on their left. You can get a picture of Charles Heston, right? I mean, the Ten Commandments. You can see the water parting. I mean, it was a supernatural, miraculous deliverance from all that terrible things that were happening to the people in Israel in, in Egypt. But the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground with a wall of water on their right and on their left. That day, the Lord saved Israel from the hands of the Egyptians. And Israel saw the Egyptians lying dead on the shore. And when the Israelites saw the mighty hand of the Lord displayed against the Egyptians, the people feared the Lord, they put their trust in him and in Moses, his servant. So here's just the story of the hardships that God heard their cry, delivered them through a mighty miracle, the parting of the Red Sea, and he led the the, the Israelites out of Egypt. But God never takes us out of something unless he wants to lead us into something. So just think with me. I mean, he he always takes us out to something better. So, I mean, just a broad view of the history of the Old Testament is God delivered them out of Egypt. He saved them. And he was going to do what? Lead them into promised land. And the land he was going to lead them into is Israel today. I mean, in 1948, Jackie and I were born, but in 1948, 
Israel was reborn as the nation where the Jews live. I mean, there's great significance in what's happening in the world today in the Mideastern areas. Uh, Israel and the, um, man, this, this book on ISIS, I've already started writing it. To get one, they're right back there. And uh, Dwayne Graybill brought them, and you can talk to him. But So Israel was under bondage. God heard their cry. He delivered them. He got them out of Egypt. I mean, it was a couple of million people that he got out of Egypt, men, women, and families. And so they're out in the desert, and they're, 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 they're moving somewhere. Now, where are they moving? He got them out of Egypt. They're moving to the promised land. The promised land, Israel. In other words, when God takes you out of something, man, he always has something better for you. So the, the next little little passage, uh, and, and let me just describe a little bit about how it was working at that particular time. I mean, here's a couple of million people wandering through the desert. Manna fed them. Quail. God brought quail for them to eat. God supernaturally brought water out of the rock. He led them during the day by the cloud, and he led them by a fire by night. You can read all this. I mean, it's just like the supernatural deliverance of God from Egypt and then the supernatural guidance, and he was taking them into the promised land. In Numbers 1.44, if you could uh, go from Exodus uh, to Numbers chapter 1, verse 44. Numbers is a book that describes the Israelites about ready to move into the promised land. Numbers chapter 1, verse 44. I, I wonder, it, it seems like there are more pages turned over here and and over here, it's like the silence of the iPhone, <laughs> you know? That's interesting. We don't have any signs, do we, that say uh, older people. Oh, oh. <clears throat> maybe, maybe that'll stir them up a little bit, Caleb. But it, it, there's definitely the turning of pages over here, and I, I'm, I know I'm not, I, I trust that you're, you're, you're looking at these things. So numbers... And, and please stick with me through this part because I, I, it, it, I, I'm, I'm making a, a very specific point. Numbers 144. These were the men counted by Moses and Aaron and the 12 leaders of Israel, each one representing his family. All the Israelites, 20 years old or more, who were able to serve in Israel's army were counted according to their family. And verse 46 is just the focal the total number was 6, 603,550. All right, so they were delivered out of Egypt. They were led by the cloud. They were ready to go into God's good promised land that he had promised them. God had promised them this land. And here it says, take a census. And so this is the result of the census. They counted every man that was 20 years old or older and was able to be in the army. And here's the number, 6, 603,550. Now, um, th then you'd add wives to that and you'd add children to that. And like I said, there's a couple of million people on the outskirts of the promised land. Now, We get to the familiar story, perhaps, in Numbers chapter 13. Numbers chapter 13. Delivered from Egypt, led by God, ready to go into the promised land. Now, this is the story of the 12 spies that went into the promised land, came back and made a report. Chapter 13 Verse 1 and 2, the Lord said to Moses, send some men to explore the land of Canaan, which I am giving to the Israelites. 
I am giving to the Israelites. Send some men to explore the land I am giving to the Israelites. And so they sent a group in. And um, if you read some of the details, this is what they were told to do. All right, now just if, if you could picture this, this is progress. This is moving forward. This is God's best. This is God's best for you and I. It's like he has a promised land. He has promised us some things. You know, in the New Testament, Jesus said uh, the, the, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But I have come that you might have life abundantly. And, and, and I, my, my message today is to say that there are things that even as Christians will keep us from moving into God's promised land. There are some things as Christians that will keep us from making progress into that abundant life that Christ has. And so on one hand, this is a sobering message today. Because as for me, I want everything God has for me. When I get into the Word of God, man, I am encouraged not to part. I am an enc I'm encouraged to have a good, strong marriage. I'm encouraged to do a good job raising my children. I'm encouraged to have a good name in the community. I'm encouraged that I can be salt and light and I can make a difference out there. I'm encouraged that I can be blessed with my finances. I can be encouraged. I'm encouraged when I read the Bible that, that my health can be good because I take care of the body that is the temple of the Holy Spirit. In other words, there's all these, and, and I guess we could say that they're the promises of God, that he promises us abundant life. I don't think he promised us riches, but he promises us financial stability. I don't think he promises us divine health, but he promises us if we'll eat right, and if we'll exercise, and if we'll sleep and get rest and take care of our bodies, that we can have a body that will propel us into the promises of God and, 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 and enable us to be active for the Lord and active in the world today for a long time in the financial part of that. So I guess what I'm talking about is, is the promised land that the Israelites were fixing to go in to explore is the abundant life for you and I as Christians. Spiritually, it could be defined as Christ-likeness. God has a plan for you to conform you into the very image of Jesus Christ. And I, as a pastor, when I think about the church, I think about the promised land for the church. He's given gifted men and women to the church to equip the church for the works of service that the body of Christ may be built up. And it be, may, may become a mature body. We might reach unity in our faith and unity in our knowledge of God. And, and I mean, it's just everything comes down to progress. We are called to make progress. And, and, and sometimes the obstacles to that progress is what we have a tendency to focus on. And therefore, we don't make the progress. So for us that are parking... You know, I just want to encourage you that God says it's time to move on. According to the prophetic word last week, it's time to move on. So I want to show you just a little bit about what happened. So here we are where the Egyptians were, were delivered from the, from, from the bondage. They were led by God to the promised land. It took about a year, by the way. It took about a year. And there's a whole lot of things that happened in that year. And you can read all that, but... A year after they got delivered out of Egypt, they here at the promised land. Now, what was the will of the Lord for those people right there? The will of the Lord was for them to go in and take the promised land that he was giving them. The will of the Lord is for you to move into the fullness of God. The will of the Lord is to move in and make progress in your marriage, in your finances, in your effect in the world outside. That's the will of the Lord is to make progress, to be pushed forward by the power of the Holy Spirit. So we go down to Numbers 13, verse 26. 
And this is the report. The twelve men went into the promised land. They were told to look at the people. Are the people weak? Are they strong? Are they few? Are they many? These twelve spies were told to look at the land. Is the land good or bad? Are the towns walled or fortified? What about the soil? They were told to look at the soil. Is it fertile, rich, or poor? They were told to look at the trees. Are there trees? They were told to bring some of the fruit back. In other words, they were told to go into the promised land, come back, and give a report. And we see what they said in verse 26, Numbers 13, 26. They came back to Moses. I'm reading in verse 26. They came back to Moses and Aaron and the whole Israelite community at Kadesh in the desert of Paran. There they reported to them and to the whole assembly and showed them the fruit of the land. They gave Moses this account. We went into the land to which you sent us. And it does flow with milk and honey. Here is its fruit. They they brought fruit back, you know, two or three of the guys. Well, here's the thing. So, and then look at the, in verse 28. But the people who live there are powerful, and the cities are fortified and very large. We even saw descendants of Anak there. The Amalekites live in the Negev. The Hittites, Jebusites, Amurites live in the hill country, and the Canaanites live near the sea and along the Jordan. You, you see what was happening? I mean, they came back and said, the land is good. Now remember, God was giving them the land. He says up here, I'm going to give you, this is your place. This is what I have for you. I'm going to give this to you. And they came back and, and verified, man, it's a good land. It's a great land. The promised land would be a good place for us to be, but their focus was not on God's promise and God's bigness and God's goodness. Their focus was on the people. Their focus was on the fortified cities. And basically they said, we can't do it. But let's go on a little bit. Verse 30. Then Caleb silenced the people before Moses and said, we should go up and take possession of the land for we can certainly do it. Thank God for Caleb. I mean, if, if, that's not, if that's just what you've come to hear today, may the Spirit of the Lord put that in your heart. May the Spirit of the Lord just put that one sentence in your heart. I don't know if you're identifying with progress and parking and the promised land and moving into the abundant life moving into more Christ-likeness, moving into successful living in this crazy world in which we live. But I, I, I guess there was a group of people that said, progress is impossible because of the circumstances. And then there were two guys, Caleb and Joshua, who came back and saw the same thing. And they said, we their focus was not on all the size of the people or the fortifications of the cities what was their focus what was Caleb and Joshua what set Caleb and Joshua apart from the other ten who came back and just started shaking because the people were so big and the cities were so far apart what was the difference these two young men there was something in them they had faith in God they had faith in God that if God is giving us this land, we can take it. And I'm saying to you, man, God is giving this church and each one of us individually. He is giving us things out there. He is empowering us to make progress. Perhaps you've been sitting in a marriage that has gone a little stale. And you want to make progress? Yes, by God's grace, your marriage can make progress. Perhaps you're sitting in a financial tight place 
And by God's grace, I would never promise you that you can have a big house and a fine car, but I can promise you that God will supply your needs. I can promise you that if you will be responsible in how you take care of your body, your health will improve. I believe God can heal miraculously, but I believe God works through people who eat right, exercise right, rest right, and boy, they have an energy that's from God, but it has to do with us living responsibly. I believe that God wants us to have an impact out there in the world. And I believe that you can do that. But we can't be like the ten that looked at all the obstacles. I mean, it's such a simple message, man. We just have to fix our eyes on the Lord Jesus Christ. Fix our eyes on God. Let's read just a little bit more of um, their reaction. Verse 30, Then Caleb silenced the people before Moses and said, Man, we should go up. We can take possession of this. We can certainly do it. We can certainly do it. Now, he wasn't trusting in his ability. He was not trusting in the size of the army of the Israelites. He was trusting in God. So verse 31, but the men who had gone up with him said, we can't attack those people. They are stronger than we are. Now, let's just evaluate that just a minute. We can't attack those people. They're stronger than we are. Is that the point that the people out there, the fortified cities, are stronger than the Israelites? You know, that's not really the point. When God has promised us something, God is the point. And God is stronger than those guys. I mean, they were just basically saying, hey, we're this way and they're that way. They're bigger than us and they're going to kill us if we go into that promised land. And man, they, they, was just, they were voidless of God. I mean, God was just not with them. God, they just had no sense, no faith, no, no sense of, man, we can make progress because our God is for us. That was Caleb and, and Joshua. So verse 31, let me just read it again. But the men who had gone up with him said, we can't attack those people. They're stronger than we are. Verse 32. And they spread among the Israelites a bad report about the land they had explored. They said, the land we explored devours those living in it. All the people we saw are of great size. We saw the Nephilim there, the descendants of Anak. You know, it's like, have you ever been around that kind of person? I mean, they just spread the bad news. They spread the bad report. They, they, uh, they, they just don't have any faith that we can do it. And they just bring everybody else down. The land we explored devours those living in it. All the people we saw there were of great size. Verse 33, we saw the Nephilim there, the descendants of Anak coming. And look at this final verse. And I know that you've heard sermons on this, and this is a popular passage, but... By God's Spirit, let's just receive this. Look at the last part of that, the last verse in uh, chapter 13. We seemed like grasshoppers in our own eyes, and we looked the same to them. And it's almost like, man, they were just swimming. You know, they were just, those guys are nine feet tall, and we're six feet tall. Those guys have metal armor, and we've got wooden sticks, you know, and it was just, you can just kind of feel, I mean, you can just kind of feel they were just thinking, man, compared to them, we're just grasshoppers. We're nothing. We can't do it. There's no way we can move forward in that situation. Fortified cities, and Amorites, and Jebusites, I mean, all these people, and gosh, I just, I just don't want to be like that. I don't want our church to be like that. And I don't want you to be like that. And more than that, it's not like, oh, I'm going to try to... Well, I mean, I don't think you want to be like that. I mean, and, and maybe this message is just a simple message of faith. Two people saw exactly the same thing and they say, we could do this. And ten people saw exactly the same thing and they say, no way, we can't do this. I want you to hear from your pastor that with God, all things are possible. And gosh, nothing new about that, Brother Dick. You're right. But is it in your heart? 
Has have your eyes been open to that fact of what God has given you and what God wants for you? And you can be successful in God's will for your life. And we park because we've been disappointed or because the obstacles are too big, but we move forward when we start understanding that we are more than conquerors through Him who calls us. We start moving ahead when we realize that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. We, we start moving forward when we focus upon who we are in Christ and who God is instead of all the obstacles in front of us. Twelve men went in. They saw how good the land was but they got distracted by the obstacles. Chapter 14, let's just read a couple more verses. Verse 1, chapter 14, verse 1. That night, all the members of the community raised their voices and wept aloud. All the Israelites grumbled against Moses and Aaron. And the whole assembly said to them, If only we had died in Egypt or, or, or in the wilderness. Why is the Lord bringing us to this land only to let us fall by the sword? It's like a snowball, you know. Ten men came back and gave a bad report, and it just spread like wildfire. It was trending now, you know. It went viral on the YouTube, you know. We can't do this! And that can invade a church. That can invade a family. That can invade your heart. And that's not God. Our wives and our children will be taken as plunder. Wouldn't it be better for us to go back to Egypt? And they said to each other, listen to this. Well, let's choose a leader and go back to Egypt. That's why I had us read that verse back there about how terrible it was in Egypt. And so the end result of all this is said, hey, let's go back to Egypt. Then Moses and Aaron fell, fell down, face down, in front of the whole Israelite assembly gathered there. Joshua, son of Nun, Caleb, son of Jephthah, who were among those who had explored the land, tore their clothes and said to the entire assembly, and I just want to read this to you because these are the two men that saw everything that everybody else said. They heard what happened overnight. They watched YouTube. They, you know, saw what was happening in the midst of the people. But they rose up and they stood in faith, believing that if God said it, if God promised it, we can do it. This is what they said in verse 6. The land... I'm sorry, it's verse 7. And they said to the entire Israelite assembly, the land we passed through and explored is exceedingly good. If the Lord is pleased with us, he will lead us into that land, a land flowing with milk and honey, and will give it to us. Only do not rebel against the Lord and do not be afraid of the people of the land because we will devour them. Their protection is gone but the lord is with us do not be afraid of them and i guess those kind of passages man they they force me they they motivate me into progress there is nothing that god has called me to us to that we cannot accomplish in the power of the lord jesus christ well god showed up that day god was not pleased because even with the faith declaration of Caleb and, and Joshua, the people decided that they were going to go back to Egypt. God showed up and he said, hey, because you have not believed in me, because you have not decided to go into the promised land, because your faith was so small or non-existent, you're going to wander around in the wilderness for 40 more years until... The whole generation of men die out. In other words, God must have seen something that was fatally flawed in the hearts of those men. And if you remember, we took a picture of the 
census in Numbers chapter 1. How many men was it? 603,000 men. We won't go to it right now, but at the end of Numbers, why don't you investigate a little bit? There's another census. And it's 40 years later. After those 603,000 men wandered through the wilderness because of their disobedience, because of their idolatry, because of their immorality, because of all the things that was flawed inside of them, they all died in the wilderness except two men. And you know who that is, Joshua and Caleb. So the book of Numbers presents this incredibly sobering picture. Numbers chapter 1, there were 603,000 men who were 20 years old and could, or older and could serve in the army. Numbers chapter 28, the second census, was after 40 years wandering and all those men died. And now there were 601,000 men. It was a little bit less, 601,000 men in the second census. The only names that were on both census. The only names that were on both senses was Joshua and Caleb because of their faith, because they trusted in God, because they knew that if God is for us, who can be against us? So I guess that's what I came up with this week to, to say to you. Man, we're all at different places, right? We're all at different places. I, I periodically go down the roster and look at everybody in the church and just kind of think about where they are and what they're going through and, and uh, what the challenges are. And, and I just appreciate the fact that I, as your pastor, could stand today and just say this simple truth, man. If you get all tied up in the circumstances, if you get all tied up in the problems, the issues, if you get... Uh, all tied up in what the boss said or what you, you know, these thousands of voices, you, you'll probably back off and not move into that promised land that God has for you. But man, if we can, if we can learn how to put our faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, if we can learn how to avoid the pitfalls that these guys fell into. And um, I think what I'm going to talk about next week is 1 Corinthians chapter 10, because in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, it refers back to the circumstances I just told you about, and it says these were written down for your example, for you and I to learn from. In other words, this is a sobering picture of many Christians who die in the wilderness. And I don't believe God has that for us. I believe God wants us to push in through faith and accomplish everything he has for us. I believe he wants us to have good marriages. I, I believe he wants to have good health. I believe he wants to ha us to have financial stability. I, I believe he wants us to have standing in the community. I, I believe he wants us to be salt and light out there. And I don't think that anything can hold us back as long as our faith is in God. And even go through a, a sickness or a downturn or a difficult circumstance. Man, we go through it with joy, our eyes fixed on Jesus Christ, and, and all of a sudden we see some things happening around us. I guess that's what I want to say to you. And I, I just appreciate you guys coming and listening. And, and, but just, just I, I, more and more, this is, this is what I, I'm thinking. I mean, and I've been doing this for like so long. More and more I'm thinking that there is a spiritual impartation that can take place on Sunday morning. I know it takes place in worship, man. As we lift our hands and as we sing with one voice the praises of God, something starts happening in our heart. And as we hear the word of God proclaimed and confessed over us, something starts happening in our heart. So my trust is not as much, oh, that's a great sermon, Brother Dick, and I, I want to preach good sermons, but, man, I want a spiritual impartation. I want the Holy Spirit to come and take some simple word, maybe that you've heard a hundred times before, and you could, it just, just something brightens in your, your heart. Your eyes are open. I don't want to die in the wilderness like all those people. I want to move into the promised land. 
I want to go into what God has for me. I, I'm not going to shrink back. I'm not going to get smaller for God. I, I'm not going to move into disbelief, and, I, and I'm not going to part inappropriately. I'm going to move forward in Christ. And man, the neat thing is you don't have to do it by yourself. We can do it together. Amen. Would you stand with me and, and just close your eyes and, and let me just uh, uh, speak over you a little bit and, and then we'll, we'll, we'll sing a song and, and just let the Spirit of God have His way in your heart. It, it's really, I mean, I, I guess we covered a lot of details, you know, but it, it's really just a simple message. And please don't miss the simple message. By faith in God, we can move into the promised land. And, and, and if we don't fix our eyes on God, we'll have a tendency to want to park or even like they wanted to do, go back. I believe by the Spirit that God is saying to you individually, it's time to go forward. It's time to believe God. It's time to be filled with the mighty, powerful Spirit of God. It's time to have done with lesser things. It's time to discover what the will of God is for your life. It's time to be careful how you live. It's time to be filled with the Spirit. It's time to be healed. It's time to be filled. It's time to walk in the glorious liberty and freedom that Christ has for you. Father, by your Spirit, not, not, not by human effort, not by harder, harder, harder working or discipline, Lord, but by your Spirit. Come right now and do that work in our heart that only you know we need and only you can do. Lift your hands to the Lord, sir. Receive the Holy Spirit. I, I think there's some people that, that are remembering right now a time where you were pursuing God with everything. That's where He wants you to be again. I think there's some people out there that are kind of saying, man, I've been parked for too long. God says, move upward, move onward in faith. Just raise your hand and start praying to the Lord. You pray, you talk to God. Receive his word. Holy Spirit, we welcome you to have your way in the church today. Speak to your people. Show them how much you love them. Show them what a good plan you have for their life. Show them what the first step is, Father, toward progress, toward Christ-likeness, toward healing, 